You're listening to Crushing Classical, how to thrive in your creative career. I'm your host, Janet Ingle, oboist, entrepreneur, author, and business and creative coach for musicians. Today on Crushing Classical, you'll hear my interview with Asher Long, electric violinist, composer, producer, and live performer. He's classically trained, but he's turned his instrumental skill into something much more commercial and lucrative while staying true to his own musical integrity. I hope you enjoy this episode. What does it mean to sell out as a musician? To be clear, that is not something that I am, you know, accusing my guest of doing, not in any way. But our conversation sort of danced around this topic, and it really made me think. We musicians sometimes feel, sometimes I've heard musicians express some scorn around music like the Pachelbel Canon, music like the air on a g-string, music like the Mendelssohn Wedding March, you know, for wedding gigs, for example. I have heard musicians react to sort of crossover artists like three tenors style concerts in which trained operatic voices, trained classical musicians perform more popular repertoire and, you know, to sell out crowds to enormous enthusiastic audiences. And I guess what I wonder is, is there anything wrong with offering an audience what it wants, what it has clearly indicated that it wants, what it goes absolutely wild for, especially if you can do it with your own musical integrity intact? Is there room to bring your own personal artistry and your own strong feelings as a professional musician to bear to, to, to the fore when you are teaching a 13 year old, a 17 year old student who like doesn't, who you might feel isn't worthy of your time. My husband and I left a job once and uh, it was, you know, some pops concert and we'd played it. And in the car, he said something like, I just hate it when I feel superior to the music. And like, I, I think we can probably all relate to this, right? You do some sort of pops gig with like meh arrangements and the audience goes bonkers for it because you're giving them music that they want and that they love. It may not be your favorite thing to do, but is it dirty in some way? Is it ugly in some way? Is it beneath you? Or is it listening to your audience and giving them something with all of the skill that you have and with all of the love in your heart, giving them something that they really genuinely enjoy. I'm not saying, certainly, that that's the only thing we're going to do. We're not only going to do, you know, the Who cover concerts as orchestras. We are not only going to play the Pachelbel Canon 18 times a day. You know, there's, I I'm, fully in favor, and you know that I am fully in favor, of uh, diversifying our repertoire, of making sure that we're promoting and playing music by living composers, by women composers, by composers with, you know, other marginalized identities. I'm passionate about bringing, like, interesting, intellectual, uh, enchanting new music to audiences and, and showing them. But I played a job 
wasn't a job. It was a delight. I played uh, at a winery recently, and this is a, a new music festival that's sort of that's starting up. And we, the the organizer brought together fantastic musicians from Chicago and us in from South Bend and like really high level, excellent gigging classical musicians. We all sat down together. We spent a little while sight reading um, the a, a Mozart serenade for winds and the Gounod Petite Symphony for winds. And both of these are music by dead white men. Both of these are pieces that, you know, have been in the repertoire long enough to be, you know, a little ho-hum if you want to be elitist about your classical music and if you want to be um, really forward-looking and if you want to promote new music, which all of which I, I, I do. But... It was such a pleasure and such a joy to play this music that was familiar to us, that is not by any stretch bad music, um, but that is easy, easily accessible to both us on a, a sight reading basis and to our audience. Like there's, there is an honor to that, even though this concert itself didn't particularly push any boundaries. We don't always need to push boundaries. Sometimes, maybe, it's absolutely okay to give an audience what they want in order to keep classical music a living art form. Now, my guest today, Asher Lobb, does indeed um, play music that his audience knows. And he plays music with a contemporary sound, with a contemporary spin. And he brings the full power of his classical training, his artistry, his musical integrity to the fore. Is that the only thing he does? No. He composes. He produces. He's got a, a new single coming out. He's got all sorts of, of irons in the fire. But does he attempt to make money doing the thing that he, doing the thing that audiences are asking for? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I celebrate him for it. I hope you enjoy this interview. Asher Lobb's expertise in improvisation across multiple genres has led him to a career as a soloist in demand, performing at venues such as Madison Square Garden, Hammerstein Hall, Lincoln Center, the Carnegie Hall, and across four continents. Asher has also been featured on PBS and has made headlines on CNN, NBC, and the New York Post. He's been booked to perform at special events for Google, Nickelodeon, TNT, Citigroup, um, and many, many others. In 2014, Asher lived a musician's nightmare when he lost the strength to play his violin for a number of years. Refusing to accept conventional advice, he found a way to heal, building his strength to an unprecedented level. He used this experience as fuel to reinvent his live concerts as a high-energy contemporary violinist. In only a few months, Asher learned to merge popular tunes and breakdancing choreography into his performances. Asher also uniquely performs as a DJ violinist, bringing his experience as a live performer and technical prowess as an audio editing and mixing guru to countless clubs and stages. With a growing fan base, Asher is working to influence societal norms and conventional thinking about musical performance, helping to break down social and physical barriers for his fans and beyond. So, if you are a classical musician who maybe leans a little bit more pop or electronic than your colleagues, if you're someone who's never quite satisfied just playing in the middle of the orchestra, but who also wants to create your own sounds, your own compositions, your own style of audience interaction, I want you to listen to the way Asher has made a career around figuring out what people want and how to give it to them in a way that is his very own. The money's all well and good, but he's found ways to show up with his skills and talents and make music and sound and art that fits within his own artistic integrity and still sells. And that's really what we're all looking for, right? I know you'll enjoy this interview. If you spend more than a few minutes a month on billing and scheduling for your teaching studio, you might consider Fonz. It's an all-in-one platform to help service-based businesses, like music teachers. In fact, it was originally created by a music teacher uh, to manage their clients and their billing without stress and hassle. It helps you to up-level your presence and show up to your clients and students as the professional you are. You can get a free two-week trial with the link in the show notes. 
Asher Love, welcome to Crushing Classical. It's so delightful to get to talk to you today. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, look, I watched the promo video on your site, and I'm not sure I've ever seen anything like it. Um, could we just start off by having you describe a little bit to the listeners what it is that you do and how you think about your own performances? I wear a lot of hats. Um, I guess what you saw that was pretty, it might have been intriguing, was uh, a dancing violinist. Absolutely. Which there aren't too many. Um, and that's sort of something that I uh, created, built um, about five years ago when I released my first like original single, Neon Dreams, which is all on, you know, on all major platforms. You can check it out on Spotify, iTunes. Um, but uh, I'm a contemporary violinist, classically trained pretty intensely since the age of two and a half. Uh, I've been in orchestra mm -hmm. my whole life. Uh, uh, did NISMA competitions in New York State. And uh, that sort of evolved into a career that was more in the contemporary realm of, of classical music. And that sort of branched out into jazz, pop, rock, improvisation. So I sort of blend the many different skills that I've acquired over the years um, as a as a violinist. And, and, this, and my acoustic turned into this closed body electric. Not a traditional it's amazing classical looking. at all. Our, but our I podcast play listeners can't see it, but it's easily gorgeous. Easily as frequently as the... Yeah. You know, some people see it as, as sacrilegious, which I find to be entertaining because, first of all, it is a little sacrilegious um, to be playing a, a, an electric violin. But I've managed to um, make it a bit less so uh, with the tonal quality. So when you're able to make an electric violin sound uh, like like an authentic acoustic woody instrument, but also have the, but not lose its versatility, sorry, to, but also maintain its versatility and have better volume and total control. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a reason to have it. It's not just like, oh, it's a cooler look, different, more different looking type of instrument than like a traditional acoustic classical um, violin. It's, it actually, it serves a purpose. And it's of course. And yeah. of course, and it still takes a player to play it. Like, yeah. a, so a little bit, no matter what the instrument is that you're playing, it's still your voice coming through. It's still the, the aesthetic that you bring to the, to the equation. And, and uh, thank you. And, and it's that, it's that voice is not the same as the classical voice. Um, I, I had been training, uh, throughout many years. Um, it's, it's got a bit of like a gypsy jazz player, but not even quite that. It's like a mm -hmm. little bit, it's like a shove sub. It's like a new invention kind of genre that that doesn't lend itself to like if you hear guys like Derek David Garrett I don't know if you you know he is I'm not pretty familiar major, keep pretty major um uh solo violinist uh in in Europe and um I mean he's like an he's like a young Itzhak Proman pretty much but he plays contemporary pop music also but he's like revered as like this classical genius also so mm -hmm. so something like if you hear the way that he plays pop music he plays it with very intense sort of vibrato. And um, again, he's, he's a brilliant musician, but it, he doesn't play it like a pop violinist plays it. Um, it has it has more of like a Paganini kind of feel when he plays, um, I don't know, like hip hop, whatever it is. Because sure. that's, those are, I don't know, I guess he never like let go of that because he's still sort of entrenched in, in traditional classical. So for me, I'm sure. also entrenched in traditional classical, but um, not at the concert level. I'm, I'm, I'm doing like at the concert level, I'm doing more contemporary. Sure. Like I, I think about like those three tenors concerts or the, uh, Andrea Bocelli even who like go out with their opera training and use that operatic sound and that operatic way of vocal production to sing, uh, now come up with a song, song quick, Janet, quick, um, like musical theater songs or for far more contemporary songs. And yeah. Like it's a, it's a, it's a thing. It's not for everybody, but it's for a lot of people seemingly. So, um, and for sure they had, and you have grown up with all of the classical training and all of the, um, diligence. That's not the right word exactly, but the, the details and the, the, uh, importance of those details drilled into us, drilled into you. And then what I 
see what what I think you're saying um, is about being able to let go of that and to like move with those skills into a more contemporary sound and release the the sort of baggage of classical that isn't helping you with a contemporary audience. Yeah, you pretty much took it right out of my mouth there. Um, it, it's uh, I, I find it to be an enriching experience. Um, mm -hmm. I enjoy it. I, I push myself in that direction for, for a reason. Sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. Is that as you were growing up and as you were presumably being, you know, taking violin lessons, like a, like a good little boy, um, were yeah. you, where were you hearing an influence that, that drew you towards what you're doing now? Or did that come all out of your, out of yourself? No, I was definitely hearing it. You know, I was playing my Williams Lee's high school, the high school I grew up in. Um, it's about a thousand people. So it's, and, and it's a well-supported community. So, um, you know, they had all the resources, they had the big jazz band and they had like the, they had the, um, the, you know, the smaller jam bands and like the jam rooms. And then they had the big classical orchestra, which they were basically from the four surrounding, um, equally large high schools. Um, and, and I found that uh, through the years, especially when I got to junior year in high school, I really wanted to head over to the other room by the jazz band. You know, I I, sure. I, I got a little tired of in, interpreting sheet music, like like reading the sheet music. Like it had, I just felt like it was limiting my creativity. Um, not that I don't completely value the skill that I that I built uh, reading sheet music, but I felt like I wanted to also improvise. Like yeah. I wanted both. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And I, I love that you were able to like find that and then follow that. Right. That's, that is really exciting actually. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I, I see in your bio something about a, being a DJ violinist and I know both of those words and it's hard for me to imagine what the combination of those words looks like. Would you talk a little bit about that aspect okay, so of it, what you're doing? It's, yeah. And, and, and you're, you're like, a real classical musician. So it's, it's weird. Uh, it's actually weird talking about it as, as like an authentic, <clears throat> well-trained classical musician. Cause like we never thought of like DJ violin really being a sensible thing uh, or even just being necessary. We I mean, have live, live musicians, but it, it's come as a result of demand, significant client demand. Um, and, you know, there's enormous demand for electronic music. There's enormous, enormous demand for DJs now. Maybe it's because of the internet, social media, I don't know. Uh, and I frankly got a little flustered working with DJs who didn't, who weren't really producers or who didn't value or appreciate the complexity of the music that I was, or the skills that I was bringing to the table as a violinist. And I felt like I kind of want to bring that into my own sphere and and take control of the, of the dj and the production aspects and of of, of being a dj viol that that's that's where dj viol very dj violining kind of emerged and i've seen other other similar artists crossover artists do the same thing mm -hmm. and it's like if you're, you know if a client wants a dj client wants say uh a violinist it's this is this is more of an economical route to go but it's also it doesn't it's a better route. It's it's a musically superior route to go than just like matching a random DJ with a random uh, violinist and DJs running the show and telling the violinist just improvise to different songs. It's sloppy, quite frankly. Um, mm -hmm. And and when you know your music inside and out, you're the best person to be the DJ, <laughs> frankly. And DJing properly requires a significant skill of coordination. And it's something that I think many musicians are capable of branching out to and becoming easily as good uh, DJs. And I, I think that it's something that over the years is gonna become more and more common among classical musicians or contemporary musicians. It's not just gonna be like a, sa a saxophonist or a violinist of which seems to be the most popular. Um, I, you know. I think maybe maybe when when musicians might start becoming DJs also, because again, I I can't really emphasize enough that the musician knows the music that their instrument fits best with and their solo style fits best best with. The DJ rarely does. Um, so, 
you're almost describing um like one thing that i'm hearing here is the the crossover skill of being able to to sort of read a room and know what music is required right or what what music would suit this moment in the evening there's yes. an empathy there that like again classical musicians aren't trained in necessarily because like the conductor um programs the concert and then we just sit down and do the thing but as i think about um pro chamber music programs that i've created myself or like solo recital programs that i've created myself there's always an eye to like what is the arc of this evening for the listeners and for the people who are experiencing it mm -hmm. but then I think what I'm hearing is that when you're thinking about DJing with a violin is you're almost creating like soundscapes that you can then create over like that. Yeah. Um, back, back, some, in some cases, backing tracks, if it's like a dance set, uh, where I, I do do, um, I wear a lot of hats, um, yeah. very much in the concert realm, but I also have an entertainment group, Fiddler's Dream Productions. And I enjoy most, DJing my own weddings instead of having a DJ who doesn't really understand my instrument come on as good of a producer as they may be and choose whatever sloppy mumble rap that's requested by the client it's like I, I'd rather you know work with the client and then like adapt an appropriate playlist and um, so to answer your question there's the backing tracks in that type of setting uh, wh where it's like I'm and the solo instrument is not there and i fill that in as, as the musician so yeah. ideally i would have a massive orchestra behind me but that's not always feasible sure so that's where the 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 tracks come in cosmetic tracks some of them are my pre-made ones others are purchased and then other in other cases which general djs tend, tend to prefer is just you play over their tracks you know as an instrument and it doesn't uh, it doesn't fit as well it's mm -hmm. it's a little i don't know like round full into a square peg kind of thing um and i you know like real authentic like classical fans wouldn't aren't wouldn't be as, as impressed with that type of arrangement right so you're you're trying to create an environment where like the violin is featured and is uh enhanced by what else is going on around it as opposed to as opposed to competing yeah. with a very full production which in some cases is just noisy and just doesn't fit the instrument. Yes. Yes. That makes a ton of sense. Where I know you said that, uh, that other, that you've seen this done with other, with other kinds of musicians, I guess my question here, and, and I'm, I'm trying to think from the idea of a, from the lens of a listener who is like, Oh yeah, I get it. Like I have some, experience with DJing, I have some chops on my instrument. Like the first time that you went out as the DJing violinist, the first time that you showed up, like what what does that look like at the beginning of the career or at that turning point in the career? It feels it, like hearing you describe what you do now is super exciting and inspiring and I hear your expertise in it. And I wonder what it takes to develop that what does that look like that that turning point moment it's it's really interesting the music business part is really interesting to me in other words and i think it's interesting to a lot of my listeners yeah um i mean a lot of books need to be written about it because it keeps evolving right. um but again there's the money aspect which led me in that direction it was sort of uh, you know uh, you know people are hiring these djs with no understanding or no like instrumental skill or production skill um and and i guess they have the expensive equipment but it's like some of them don't even mix and it's like so so at that point this happened maybe four or five years ago um i started to move more heavily into or at least start branching branch out into more dj music that was also with the forming of fiddler's dream productions entertainment group um and there was just a, a lot of demand for djs uh so that sort of led that led down that that direction um i would say uh there are many things that many different types of ex client experiences that might lead a musician like myself um in the dj direction and uh might lead them to to pick up djing um in order to complement and to not have to lose their career as a as a classical musician so if you're not like a 
if you're not in the New York Philharmonic or like the Boston Symphony, um, the, 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 you know, or teaching, or you, you, if you don't want to teach and you're really like hell bent on like live performance, yeah. uh, which many people are, uh, or you just, you want to provide a service that is useful, highly useful to a diversity of listeners. Um, or you don't want to be caught with your pants down um, in front of like 250 people at an event where you were, where the client more often than not uh, was really unclear about their expectations and wanted X, Y, Z music requests, but requested uh, ABC music requests. So I just listed like a whole series of reasons why it, it, it is extremely useful and beneficial for an instrumentalist to become a DJ and to really understand, to branch out into sound, um, knowing how to use a mixer, amplifying your own equipment, because it, unless you have like a major record label managing all your stuff, uh, or you have, or you're working solely as a side man uh, at the will of, of a band or a wedding band or a whatever band manager, which I did for probably 12 years. And then I just got tired of it. Uh, you, if you want to be your own independent act uh, and you want to sort of have flexibility to present a variety of music to your clients, which is pretty much very much in demand these days, mm -hmm. uh, every client is different. Uh, that'll lead you down the DJ route. I hope I answered your question clearly. I, I've been doing this a lot, but there's a lot, there's a lot of facets to what led me to incorporating DJ music uh, and, and still allowing me to maintain like in classical integrity. Yes. Yeah, exactly that to where you don't feel like you're selling out, but you also feel like you're giving something like you're giving the client what they want while also maintaining your own integrity about the music making, which is amazing. Like that's not actually an easy needle to thread all the time. Thank you. Uh, and I, I appreciate you saying that because it's, it's a tremendous amount of work that may not be, apparent to people, mm -hmm. uh, possibly to classical musicians. Um, but, de but I, I don't even know if a lot of, um, of my clients appreciate, I mean, some of them do some of them like, you got a lot of like technical stuff going on here. I've cables running everywhere and preamps and wireless units. And like the sounds gotta be right. A million things can go wrong. Um, and then when you're adding on top of that, like a DJ controller, you really have to know it inside and outside. And I have to tell you the first, like, I don't know, 150 times that I got on, a, did, did a job and I was thinking everything's perfect. Every, like, there's going to be no issues, some glitch, some technical glitch. And that's really like what a, D, a DJ alone who doesn't play an instrument needs to really be, be trained in. Um, forget about their mixing skills. They have to understand the tech. They have to keep the, the software machine. updated. Yeah. There's sure. a lot. Well, but on. this is, this is live music too. I mean, this is, this is, in so many ways, everybody's experience, right? I can spend all the time in the world in my practice room going for the most perfect version of like this exact phrase ending. And then I get into the actual real world. And during the actual real world performance, there's always something going on. There's, I mean, it's an oboe, right? It'll fall apart at the drop of a hat. So like there's a breeze, there's too much heat, there's too much air conditioning. There's uh, the audience coughs at the wrong time. There, the thumb rest falls off of my instrument. The reed chips against my teeth at a critical moment. Like, and I know that oboe, oboes themselves are sort of designed to self-destruct at any yes, moment. But also, like, live music is live music. You know, how many concerts have we been in where the violinist has broken a string? Like, I played a concert actually where a cello, the solo cellist somehow caught his bow on the like corner of the of the inset of the cello. There's a word for that. I don't know what it is. And like ripped the face of the cello off in performance. Like there's always something that happens. So yes, then we, I don't know why I like ran down this tangent so much. I but never saw that before. No, that was pretty wild. That's the only time I've seen that. Sounds um, like a prank. Almost, except like real expensive prank. Oh my God. Um, but just to say like, yes, live music is a thing and there's always going to be something that goes wrong. So how, how are you as the musician, as the live performer going to be able to fix it, adjust for it, account for it, pivot around it, be resilient around it? Like that's all part of it. 
By the way, do you make your own reads? I sure do. I remember my brother spending hours a week making his own reads. And I was like, there's got to be a quicker way to do this. Because very I think expensive. The quick- huh? Oh, it's crazy. The quicker way is to buy them from me, of course, from my own read business. Oh, of course. Of course. Makes sense. Well, he's he's a businessman now, so he gave that up, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah, many, many moving parts to being a live performer and many moving parts to dealing with the electronics as well. Mm-hmm. Of and course. It can all be pretty nerve wracking. Of course. All of that mm-hmm. is totally true. Yeah, and you got to have backups of everything. I mean, for me, I bring two violins on, on trips, onto gigs. I bring two DJ controllers. I bring multiple speakers, multiple mixers. So anything go wrong. Yes, anything that can go wrong will. Um, Can I ask you about this line in your bio about something happened in 2014 when you lost the strength to play your violin for a number of years? Like what was, can can I ask about that? Sure, you can. I'm I'm an open book. Uh, There's a bunch of articles published on that. uh, And I'm I'm fine chatting about it. Um, So I, I was diagnosed with adrenal insufficiency and that was actually eight, about eight years ago. Um, four, I don't know, like four or five years prior to that, I was I diagnosed with uh, this inflammatory condition, pretty rare. Um, maybe it's not so rare anymore, but um, you know, I, I went to a neurologist and they basically, you know, they said, hey, you got this. And they tested me out, pretty painful test. And uh, up, up and down my legs, sticking like needles all over the place. And you just have like an inflammatory condition. So. I guess that progressed to adrenal insufficiency and um, I, I ended up in a wheelchair for about six months and I got out and uh, and I hit the ground running as soon as I did because um, um, I was really inspired to make music uh, a full-time career, which I had not initially intended uh, when I went, went to get three other degrees in the sciences. So here I am, pretty healthy, uh, you know, uh, way healthier than I was before. And, uh, and it took... Uh, it was a pretty Herculean effort. I'm just going to say that. Um, I, it, it would be a really, really long conversation, but in a, in a nutshell, it got better. And, um, and I hope to be able to inspire other people who might be in a similar predicament or, you know, have even not, uh, even if you just have like physical ailments or just different challenges in their life. And um, like I say, there, when there's a will, there's a way. And you look at people like Teddy Roosevelt who are, um, probably one of the most inspiring individuals um, for me growing up. And I kind of looked to him uh, realizing that, you know, he was a sick kid. He became the president of the United States. Like he really was not destined to that type of position, but he mm. built himself up. And, um, you know, if you, if you make the right decisions, uh, you know, you don't have to take no as an answer, which is pretty much what I got uh, from many practitioners uh, when I was on a permanent dosage of Cortef. And I had to make life adjustments and I very much, um, whoops, sorry. <laughs> and I very much, um, very much figured out, figured it out. And, and, uh, that's why I started dancing on stage because I felt like it was like the ultimate expression of, uh, you know, my music. Oh, that's really cool. So that's when the dancing on stage began as a response yeah. to, as a response to having not been able to do that at all. Yeah, it was almost like a fuck you to like all the people who couldn't help me. Frankly, like I, I'm a little bit cynical, but it like literally there like, when I needed help, nobody came to help. Like nobody was really nobody really got me out of that except for myself. And uh, you know, a couple of key people, but but um yeah, I just I I, I just felt like I'm just gonna like life's short. Life's too short to not have a lot of fun. I just stopped caring. I just felt like, this is what I want to do. It's not what I do for every performance, but it was sort of like this key shift in my public persona, appearance, branding, whatever, that I felt like what would be a nice uh, compliment to what I was doing, along with the release of Neon Dreams, which is my big single, uh, launched you know, my, my career as, as an independent artist and um, producer. Mm-hmm. That is really amazing. I am struck by I'm struck by the the way you talk about like adding the the movement and the dance in and being a 
solo producer and being a solo artist on the on this side of that illness and how um like how what a strong i'm struck by how it sounds like some of the of the inhibitions of the classical world like we we i think we all sort of live within them to one degree or another like this is the way that we walk out on stage and we take a bow with our like suzuki uh violin tucked under the arm in exactly that suzuki way right we we are all sort of trained in this way of being and it sounds as though you can obviously correct me if i'm if i'm misunderstanding this it sounds as though just having this uh health crisis made you able to sort of slip that that chain even a little bit more and just move toward what you wanted to be doing with the instrument and what you wanted to be doing and how you were going to make money from it too. Yeah, yeah, essentially. I mean, you said it really well. Um, but it wasn't just like, it, it wasn't like a stick it to the classical world. Uh, it was mm -hmm. more like a stick it to everybody, like, like conventional thinking, um, just like what is considered to be good performance, what's considered to be a normal performance. I just felt like, you know, this, this is going to become a normal performance in a, in a few years or another decade. Like it's, people, people want to see something different. And, and, uh, this is something I felt really passionate about. I felt like I enjoyed, enjoyed it. And almost the fact that it was a little bit embarrassing to me to dance on stage was kind of like what drove me to it. I almost like wanted to get up there and be like, yeah, it's embarrassing. I'm going to do it because I don't care. And, and like, again, I'm going to be dead in like 60 years or so. Um, sorry to be like Frank, but that's seriously how, like, I think now having pretty much lost the ability of my, my legs to work and, and just to, to, to function as, as an independent human being and to having to depend on other people, I just feel like life's too short to, to always be concerned about what other people are thinking. And I just spent too much time doing that. And it, yeah, and it and it sounds a little bit like um, being being willing to believe in like exactly what Western medicine was telling you um, would have been a mistake in the same way that believing what all of the history of classical music was telling you would also have been a mistake for you. I'm maybe putting words in your mouth, but like I, I feel like I see a parallel there. Well, you are, but I feel like you're interpreting. Um, I feel like you understand more more of the situation that I might have expected you to. Um, I have a, a traditional nursing degree from NYU hmm. actually. So I'm very careful with, with my wording and I don't, um, I don't begrudge any of my, any of my professors or any of the education. But what I do is I, is I caution people um, when it comes to their health. Uh, you know, if they're told that, okay, this is how it is and these are your only options, it's not necessarily the case. You know, this notion that every single thing is genetic and we're, we aren't plastic, meaning the plasticity of our genes, our DNA uh, is for that we're absolutely fixed. It's completely false from like an evolutionary standpoint and um, biological standpoint. And, um, and, and that like scientific explanation should like encourage or inspire anybody who might feel like they're limited uh again mm -hmm. physically cognitively mentally like there there are always options out there to explore and that are worth exploring if you feel limited as a human being or in your in your abilities to do whatever uh in whatever career you are so right there if you feel limited like look for the way around that limitation yeah, don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to like look funny with funny questions. I mean, I, I asked all sorts of like funny, controversial questions in nursing school, actually. And I've asked all sorts of funny, controversial questions in the music industry because I didn't want to get stuck in like a traditional wet sideman wedding band kind of musician situation, which is cool. Like it pays the bills. I love it. But I wanted more than that. I wanted to explore other things. I wanted to connect with fans directly, which I was unable to do in that type of setting. So for that reason, I moved into production and uh, working with promoters and um, uh, doing concert fundraisers, that kind of stuff. 
and connecting with fans on, on social media in live formats and so on and so forth. Uh, because I, you know, I thought like, I need to kind of think out of the box here and granted the major labels are pushing the vocalists, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a place for the instrumentalists to shine. Also, we don't always just have to be part of a collective uh, group of, of instruments. We, we can, but that's what we want to do. My aunt's in the, in the Boston symphony. She loves it. She's passionate about it. Um, and she's one of the reasons that got me into classical music in the first place. Um, but, but for those people where it doesn't work, there are many other options out there for you. It's not, you don't, you don't have to go conventional all the time. You can also invent your own path. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's what I did. That is gold. That is gold. That last five minutes is stunning. You are amazing, Asher. Um, you have a, a new single coming out that, uh, would you talk about that a little bit, please? Yeah. Atlantis is, um, it is the story of the last couple of decades of my life. It's it's a bit like Neon Dreams, not melodically or tune or like style wise. Uh, it's it's quite a bit more sophisticated actually. It's more in the classical realm, but it also maintains its it's just to make you laugh, but like it's electronic integrity. You expect me to say classical? Sure. But it's because it, I'm an electronic more. I moved into electronic five years ago, so that was sort of like my branding. But uh, I felt like I I. I care about what my classical listeners think of my abilities and what I do. And, and I care about what they want to hear. And they don't always just want to hear like me play. They don't just all want to hear, um, you know, top forties all the time. And I do, I do that like mix of covers again, like some of that's a business move. Um, you know, I, there's more to that, but Atlantis is my, message to people that I am a true classical musician. Um, but also that it's more than just that. It's not just about me. The song itself showcases the beauty and the sophistication of the violin without losing its, this is again, backwards, it mm -hmm. losing its contemporary or uh, typical like electronic cool type of vibe, like electronic producers, like Kygo, I don't know if you can listen to these guys. Um, they're more into the tones, into the sounds, and not as much into the melody, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the sophisticated sophistication of the instrumentation and the chord progression. And I feel like this song, Atlantis, showcases that and is a reflection of, like I mentioned, like the last 20 years or so, just describing the tune because you haven't actually heard it. It starts kind of ominous, a little bit depressing and, and moves, evolves into like this climactic, hopeful, hopeful climax. And then it cycles back into the intro again, um, you know, a little bit more depressing and, mm -hmm. and ominous. And then again, into this climax and is, um, I think I'd like your listeners to listen to the song and then kind of sort of project their own interpretation onto it because it is purely instrument instrumental no yeah. vocals yeah and uh i don't know i hope that sort of gives you a general idea of the song that's fantastic thank you so much for talking about it and talking about like your your own thinking about the the art that you are producing right now that you are creating fantastic i love it and i love it asher thank you so much for talking with me today it's been such a pleasure thank you so much thanks for having me so much for joining me today. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe on your app of choice and leave a review too. It really helps us. Don't forget to check out Fonz if your own teaching or service-based business needs better systems and use the link in the show notes for our special offer. Our theme music was composed by Dream Vance. You can hear his first album, Reentry, on Spotify and Apple Music and follow him there for more innovative synthwave music. You can find me at JanetEngel.com, which is also where you can pick up a copy of the Happiest Musician book, reach out to me with thoughts or questions about this podcast, or apply for a possibility session to explore your own portfolio career and thriving musical life. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day.